So um, we've been talking to David Turner, professor at uh, Swansea and a historian. He's going to give us a short view of disability, employment and livelihood. Over to you, David. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. OK, so let's start by thinking about what things were like before the Industrial Revolution. And I think what's really important to emphasise is that there was expectation that everybody would work if they were capable of doing so. And so we find plenty of examples of disabled people doing various things. Uh, so, um, for example, in the uh, census that the authorities in Norwich took in, in 1570 of the town's uh, poor population, we have an entry for Elizabeth Mason, who's an eight-year-old widow, and she's described as a so-called lame woman of one hand. But in spite of that, she is spinning and winding using her one hand. Um, so local authorities like those in Norwich, they often sort of using some of their resources to try and keep disabled people in work. So they are supplementing their wages in various occupations, ranging from um, sort of shoemaking to uh, um, shopkeeping and agricultural work and we even find some trades which are particularly associated with disabled workers uh, one of them is the tailoring profession and um, which was something where lots of boys with um, mobility impairments were apprenticed into um, and that's because they could do it sitting down so that particular trade becomes associated uh, with disabled people the industrial, industrial Revolution is often seen as marking a really decisive change in disabled people's work experiences. So before the Industrial Revolution, um, the argument goes people mostly worked at home, uh, that they had more flexibility to work at their own pace, and they were surrounded by their loved ones so that they had more support. When industrialization comes along, um, there's an assumption that disabled people were excluded from the workforce because of mechanization. So work became faster, um, hours of work became more regulated and um, standardization also had an impact on the flexibility with which people could work. That's a theory at least, but in practice, histories of, uh, historians have shown that industrialization is a much more complicated process and therefore disabled people's experiences are much more complex. So if you look at the 1851 census, for example, right in the middle of the period we think of as the Industrial Revolution, about a third of adults worked in some kind of manufacturing, um, but only 5% of those people worked in factories, which is sort of the, seen as the place where these uh, really big changes are taking place. So, um, so, so we can't generalize too much about experiences of work and this general principle that disabled people were expected to work as, as far as they're able to, this continues right through uh, into the industrial period. So we also sometimes tend to think about the industrial revolution as a moment where disabled people are segregated from society because their families found it difficult to look after them. They're increasingly shunted off into workhouses or other kinds of institutions. And we do find more uh, disabled people in workhouses in this period. Um, but what's also striking from lots of sources is just how common disability was on the streets of industrial towns and cities in uh, the 19th century. Um, so um, the uh, slide here shows uh, workers at the Kavartha Forge in Merthyr Tydfil, a big iron making uh, town. And uh, when the uh, London newspaper, The Morning Chronicle, visited Merthyr in 1850, its correspondent noticed that he, he said the streets are thronged with the maimed and mutilated. And it goes on to say that in a distance of 100 yards, I once saw three men moving in different directions, two of whom had lost a leg and the other both legs. And he then goes on to say there's a frequent practice for men disabled in this manner to learn to play the harp, by which means they earn a precarious and scanty subsistence. And you find these kind of descriptions elsewhere. In fact, uh, one doctor estimated in Leeds in 1831 that only 10% of the working population 
had full health. So this so important point to men, make then is that disability is normal in industrialising Britain. But what of disabled people's work experiences? Well, for some people like um, the person mentioned by the uh, Morning Chronicle, this might in involve uh, going into other areas of work, like uh, working as musicians. But it's also striking that disabled people weren't automatically excluded from the kind of industries that we associate with industrialization. So you do find disabled workers in factories in the early 19th century, and you do find a lot working in or around coal mines. So mining is an industry where there's very high rates of mortality. And, but for every person killed, maybe there are 100 more who are seriously injured in accidents, some of whom would be left permanently disabled. Of these people, you do find some actually going back to work underground. So you do find records in the 19th century accounts of people with wooden legs working at the coalface underground. But mines are... Um, diverse workplaces, there are hundreds of jobs at a, a 19th century coal mine. And so other men found work uh, on the surface, um, maybe looking after the lamps that miners took with them um, when they uh, descended the pit. This was in part a consequence of the high levels of disability. So there was a kind of moral obligation on the part of employers to try and find uh, men work. I mean, they're good employers and bad employers, but there was this, sen this sense that um, employers would try to find some work if, uh, if that was available. Um, sick and impaired people face pressures to work. Okay, so we need to sort of understand this in the context of fear of the consequences of not working. So particularly fear of the stigma of being reliant on poor relief or um, even or in worst case scenarios being sort of um, forced to go and live in the workhouse. So that, that fear seems to be driving people on, that sort of desire to, to support themselves and contribute to uh, the well-being of their families. There's also, I think, the threat of losing work to non-disabled um, co-workers. So, you know, uh, so that might have forced people to continue to work um, when really they would be better uh, getting um, support at home. The whole variety of enabling and disabling factors um, ranging from the attitude of employers, which could vary across different sectors, it might depend on the variety of employment in a particular area. So is there a diversity of, of other occupations that people could go into, um, what kind of family support someone has, and of course, you know, the, just the the, um, the, the, the conditions of, of individual impairments which might determine exactly what you are able to do. We find disabled people working in industrial communities, for example, we find lots of disabled people working as school teachers in uh, mining areas, uh, which perhaps shows that their communities uh, wanted them to have uh, jobs of status within um, the, their, their towns and villages. What kind of support were there for people who weren't able to work? Well, in dangerous in industries such as coal mining, disability acts as a, as a spur to the growth of trade unions. So mass meetings, um, trying to get men to join trade unions often referred to the threat of disability and what and the lack of, of support available for disabled people so so the union was seen as a kind of safety net to that and by the 20th century unions are playing a really important role a lot of the work of mining trade unions by the beginning of the 20th century is in fighting for compensation on behalf of disabled members Friendly societies were um, voluntary associations where workers uh, paid a, a proportion of their wages into a fund which they could draw on if they fell ill. Uh, this was really geared towards short term sickness. So um, if you're off work for a few weeks, friendly society could be really helpful. But if you are off work permanently, then um, friendly societies weren't geared up to help you because the level of support uh, tailed off over time and, and often was limited to just a couple of years. So that meant that some workers like coal miners um, tried to devise their own forms of welfare. So in the 1860s in the northeast of England, the Miners Permanent Relief Fund, which is an, an initiative shared between uh, miners and employers, um, created a fund which did start to provide 
longer term financial aid. Over time, um, there's increasing advocacy and activism um, pointing out some of the difficulties that disabled people are facing in the workplace. And we see this in particular with regard to deaf and blind workers. So in 1854, for example, um, Elizabeth Gilbert and William Hanks Levy established the Association for Promoting the General Welfare of the Blind, which is specifically aimed at addressing the problem of the unemployment or underemployment of blind adults. And this uh, evolved into um, trade unionism, um, particularly the National League of the Blind, which uh, which um, advocated for, um, for, for not just for better conditions within these workshops, but for a more level playing field for, for blind workers uh, trying to sell things that they made. Um, with regard to deaf activism, a really interesting example is Jane Broom, um, who uh, tried to establish um, a settlement over in Manitoba in Canada to liberate deaf Britons from what, um, what she referred to as the social disabilities they faced finding work at home. So prejudice it, it, uh, from employers made, made, made it, quite, it was making it increasingly difficult for deaf people to find work. And so, so Groom tried to establish this new utopian community in Canada to try and uh, to, to enable uh, deaf people to establish their own um, community where their, their work could be valued. Towards the end of the century, we uh, have new compensation laws coming in to um, make employers liable for accidents that happen in the workplace. So people who were seriously injured at work could receive some financial support from their employers, which might have been lacking uh, in previous times. Particularly important here is the 1897 Workmen's Compensation Act. But if on the one hand, this was a form of legislation that was uh, beneficial to disabled people, on the other hand, it made employers more averse to hiring people who they saw as being risky um, in terms of uh, um, causing accidents. So um, when the employer's liability laws were to include medical testing of new employees, then uh, this is often used to exclude people with pre-existing health conditions uh, or impairments that in the views of employers and in the views of the insurance companies that were, were underpinning um, this support made them um, a risk in the workplace. So, uh, so here you have an example of something which is on the, on, the, on, the, on the surface of things beneficial for disabled people actually working to exclude disabled people systematically from the workplace. And the idea of disability evolves around this time as well and in the you know towards the end of the 19th century this this idea of being disabled as being incapable of being incapable of doing aid labor really to, starts to take shape so disability itself is is very much uh, defined in relation to the ability to work okay thank you so much david i think that's given us a real insight to start our thinking off on this journey we're having in disability history month 2024 so thank you very much thank you